Welcome to Civil Defense Radio with your host, Preston Schleinkofer. Civil Defense Radio is more than just a podcast about a new American civil defense structure. Through our total media presence, our website, Facebook, and Twitter pages, we work to inform you of the many serious threats, both natural and man-made, that our nation faces. Those issues many news outlets are afraid to speak about or unwilling to mention. Civil defense equals resiliency equals survival. To be resilient, it takes preparation, organization, and training to meet the needs of whatever situation we may find ourselves in. Civil defense helps reduce panic in a disaster, and we want to be part of your preparation. We believe this total information approach will assist you in making the best possible decisions about your safety and security for yourself, your family, your neighborhood, and community during disastrous events. We strongly recommend establishing a community-based civil defense organization in your city or county in partnership with your local emergency manager and community leaders. We offer guidance at our website at civildefenseradio.com under the Resources tab. Look for the guide at the top of the page. It is enough information to get the discussion started. And also, we are always here to help. We ask that you regularly download and listen to our shows and visit our web and, and social media platforms often at civildefenseradio.com, on Facebook at Civil Defense Radio, and on Twitter at civil underscore def, D-E-F underscore radio. Now, let's get on with our show. Today we have Andrea Forte from Centex Dart in Central Texas. How you doing, Andrea? Oh, I'm doing great. How are you this morning? Real good, real good. Uh, I'm going to read your bio here real quick so everybody knows uh, a little bit more about you. Andrea Forte is the Director of Operations and is a founding member of Centex Dart. She is a Certified Incident Command System and CERT instructor. Her training includes All Hazard Incident Commander and Planning Section Chief positions for a IMT3 team along with being a Skywarn Debris Manager and an exercise planner. Andrea has been working in emergency management since the Saras River flood in 2011 in Minot, North Dakota. In Texas, she has worked alongside city and county emergency management coordinators during Hurricane Harvey and local wildfires. As the director of Syntex DART, she helps maintain relationships and mutual agreements with agencies across Central Texas, the heart of Texas, and the Capital Area Council of Governments. She is a driving force to provide internal training and community outreach in the greater Fort Hood area community. Welcome to the show here, Andrea. This is uh, this is quite an impressive bio. Thank you. It's been a long time coming and a lot of hard work. Yes, it, it looks like it. Some of your certifications are, are not quick and easy either. No, most certainly not. The, the position-specific trainings themselves for instant command and, and planning section took significant amount of time and a lot of classroom hours to get through. Yes, I'm certified ICS as well, and I've, as a federal officer, re- now retired, we had annual recertification in the National Incident Management System and, and other areas of, of emergency management. So uh, I'm quite familiar with some of your, your qualifications here. So can you tell us about Syntex DART and how that got started? Of course. Well, uh, Central Texas Disaster Action Response Team uh, was originally developed out of a need to serve the community. Uh, most of our members, uh, particularly our founding members, uh, are retired military. Um, they were basically, we were basically looking for a way to give back to our community after having served. We began as a CERT or a community emergency response team for the city of Killeen and then developed beyond the primary goal of community outreach to uh, allow us to assist any requesting agency. In our region, uh, Central Texas uh, Council of Governments, Heart of Texas Council, and the Capital Area Council of Governments. And we work alongside other VOADs, or volunteer organizations active in disaster. Okay. And then um, I, I sent you some information about, about my organization and, and Civil Defense Radio. As you know, I, I believe that Syntex DART is a civil defense organization by another name. It is. It is. I had actually not heard anything about civil defense um, other than knowing that the, the, the sirens we have in our area are actually uh, civil defense sirens. I hadn't known anything about it 
particularly until we had first uh, talked and looked into it. And, and we are essentially a civil defense organization by another name. That's, that is very correct. <laughs> yes. You've said that uh, you've expanded out of the local area and even out of the, the local region. A friend of mine up in New Hampshire is a coordinator manager for a regional cert. He has, I believe, three counties that they respond to, which your our organization is much broader than that. We are. Uh, so our, our primary area here is our council of government. And in, in Texas, we're divided into these councils of government as uh, emergency aid. So it's, it's a large section of mutual aid agreements. And I believe we're seven counties. Uh, some are larger, some are smaller, but we're seven counties large, and at least our council of government is. And we can respond within any of these council of governments based on mutual aid agreements. And we actually respond then up into our northern counties. We have agreements in Bosque County, which is to our north in Hardy, Texas. And then down in Williamson County, where we work with the emergency management coordinator for Georgetown, the city of Georgetown. So as we start to develop and we broaden our horizons and we reach out and we communicate with these other emergency management coordinators, we can assist where they have vacuums and they have needs because they're, they may either have a search team, uh, you know, a search in their area, or they need to develop one, and we can assist in developing those for their areas as well. Well, we actually assisted developing um, another organization as our own, uh, a disaster action response team, with in the greater northeast Tulsa area in Oklahoma. Uh, they had nothing up there, and were having difficulties getting uh, emergency response for uh, a community outreach. Uh, they had responders, of course, but it's so rural up there outside of the, the Tulsa metro area that somebody reached out to me and said, how did you develop and, and how do we do what you did? And so I was able to go up there and meet with a few folks who were interested in the same program and and help them create, do the paperwork, and, and to become a nonprofit. Now, the big thing with, with us is that we're nonprofit and we're non jurisdictional. Uh, we aren't actually tied to any specific emergency management agency. So we're funded through through grants and donations. Have you considered putting together any type of plan or or uh, guide for other organizations that want to do the same that you have? We have and our standard operating uh, guidelines we have shared with other organizations so that they can either develop themselves further than what they have or just begin an organization. In emergency management, as, as you know, nothing is started from scratch. We all develop from one another, we learn from one another, and we don't reinvent the wheel. So what we have we're willing to share and, and help others grow you just have to adapt it for your own organization. Yes, that's very commendable. We do the same thing. I've got um, one full-fledged civil defense organization, which they are forming as a corporation, and they're also being sponsored by their, their local sheriff as a CERT team. So they're working on becoming CERT certified as well. And so they're they're using that as a way to immediately help the, the local population in the community and hopefully recruit. So how do you guys recruit? How do you bring more people into your organization? Well, Syntex starts with a very fluid membership uh, due to our proximity to Fort Hood. Uh, with Fort Hood being the largest uh, Army installation, we have active duty members. We actually have retired and military dependents, as well as those citizens who have no background to the military at all. Recruitment for us is generally word of mouth. We also teach two of the CERT courses a year, each year, uh, one in March and one in September that are hosted by our local fire department. And we get members that join us after taking the course. And then we also have our community outreach programs where we go to churches, schools, 
Um, we go to scouting events. So we get members to join us from there. And then our social media. Social media is the, one of the biggest things out there. And once you become a trusted source of information for emergency management and and disasters, that type of thing, that's kind of how we began growing a lot of our membership uh, in, in just recently. I've been following your, your Facebook page for a number of weeks now since I first learned about you guys. And you do a lot of in- information out there about the natural events that are occurring, whether it's wind hurricanes, tornadoes, whatever. And um, you guys are pretty active. It's it's quite impressive Facebook page and, and uh, your your information you share. Yes. Um, one of the biggest things that we notice around here is our threat and hazard assessment is that thunderstorms, weather events are one of the biggest hazards we have. So, unfortunately... Being able to put out that information quickly enough doesn't always happen. However, what we do is when we have, we have um, folks that are uh, radar trained, so they are able to look at the radar and they can see hail cores, they can watch for these hooks, the, the telltale signs of tornadoes. And with our area being so large, our, our folks being so broad, what can hit us a county north can warn the folks to our south. And about, mm-hmm. I would say, see, it's been about two weeks ago, we actually had a tornado that came through. And we were able to watch that storm progress. And because we have folks in our, um, so we have that mutual aid agreement with Georgetown, they were able to warn their folks using their sirens when we had our That's tornado great. warning. You know, Central Texas is a beautiful place, but it's also an interesting place as far as weather. I I spent, uh, well, I I retired from the Texas Army National Guard, and uh, I spent 11 summer camps out of Fort Hood. We, it seemed like almost every one of them, we had some severe weather event come in that uh, just drenched us. And when it rains out there, I mean, you guys, it rains buckets. It does. We are flat. We're called Flash Flood Alley for a reason. Uh, we flood very quickly. It takes about two inches worth of rain for us to to begin to show flooding. Even last night, we had some water over the road from some storms that came through in the in the middle of the night. Wow. What is the thing that that you guys train for most? Well, we try to. We're actually very broad. Um, the biggest thing that we work on is our community outreach, our development of exercise planning, instructing uh, infant command systems, CERT, and other courses through the state. So we actually have folks that are trained in some of the, um, the state-level G-level uh, FEMA courses. So we have a huge group of instructors. No, that's that's good. Uh, having having the breadth of of uh, expertise in there, that's uh, that's uh, very beneficial. Most definitely. Um, the other big thing that we do is our EOC staffing, our I'm sorry, emergency operations center staffing. Terrible habit of using acronyms, but we do. That's the other biggest portion that we have is just staffing our local EMC or EOCs for disasters. Now, as a I guess, independent CERT responder. Is that difficult to coordinate with with those various jurisdictions? Because a lot of times they don't want too many people coming in from outside and and being part of their their operation. It used to be. Uh, I think the best answer to that question, it used to be. Before we had built these relationships, We were just as any other volunteer walking it off the street. They didn't know who we were. They didn't know what we did. They didn't know what our capabilities were. But now, thanks to these mutual aid agreements and working alongside the different counties, Bell and Corio and Williamson County and and our other counties, they know who we are. They know what we can do. And so we're very welcome. Uh, 
we've been able to assist in volunteer coordination when we do have spontaneous volunteers come in, as well as, well as donations management, which, you know, donations can be a, 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 an incident inside of an incident. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Let's, let's talk about that in just a moment after this break. Hello, friends. Please allow me to speak with you about something you may want to add to your regular health maintenance routine as well as your preparedness supplies. A few years ago, I came across an article in a preparedness magazine that caught my interest. My wife and I have always been health conscious and we have taken various supplements over the years. However, this article introduced us to the world of essential oils. My wife began researching to find a reputable company with high quality products. What she found was a company that we have been with now for about four years using their products, many of them daily. The company is doTERRA and their products are certified pure therapeutic grade essential oils. Essential oils come in all grades on the scale, but doTERRA oils are, in our opinion, at the top. Sure, you can go to Walmart or other local pharmacy and purchase essential oils, but not many of them are recommended for internal use. Many of our oils can be used orally, topically, and diffused for their wonderful aromatic fragrance and health benefits. Some of our favorites we use almost daily are lemon, clove, frankincense, lavender, on guard blend, peppermint, and melaleuca, also known as tea tree oil. These oils have become our go-to remedies for managing our health throughout the year. In fact, we credit our oils for our overall good health. You can too. Just visit our website at Oils for Life Today. That's oils number four, lifetoday.com, and explore the wonderful world of certified pure therapeutic grade essential oils for yourself. And we're back with Andrea Forte with Centex Dart. Uh, before the break, we uh, we were talking about mutual aid agreements and donation management. Those are two subjects many people may not think about when they're wanting to get involved in CERT or even a civil defense organization. So can you elaborate on, on those two areas a little bit more? Well, with mutual aid agreements, of course, that's how you work with one another, with other agencies. Generally, they're in writing. Sometimes they can be verbal. We have some smaller volunteer fire departments that uh, their word of mouth, uh, shake the hands, if we need you, we're going to call you, and they do. Uh, they ask for your help, they want you out there, and they're going to tell you exactly what they need from you. And some of those big things, of course, being volunteer management and donations management. Volunteers love to come help, and we want them to come help. Yeah. But we also want to know what they can do, what's their, what their skills are. So having uh, a plan in place, which we have plans in place for uh, receiving volunteers, seeing what they what they want to do, what they can do physically, and then what do we have a need for? And using that is an amazing tool um, because you may not need somebody right now, but you may need them later. So having those contact information to bring them back and say, "Hey, uh, couldn't you do two days ago, but now we can. Well, now we can. So would you mind coming out and taking care of this?" People want to feel helpful. Yes, and somebody said once, and and I can't remember where, but Americans want to be the ones who save people, not the ones to be saved. That's what I saw during Hurricane Harvey in Houston was people going out and saving. They're their fellow Houstonians. Oh, definitely. And and we actually, our county, Bell County in Texas, is a point-to-point evacuation for Brazoria County, which is down there on the coast. And uh-huh. we actually receive evacuees during hurricanes. Our population here, when they realized that we needed to open a shelter, did what is incredible. They came out. They were able to help set up cots clean bathrooms, make this the shelter ready to go even before organizations like Red Cross could get there. So they were ready and available even though they didn't know what they were doing um, necessarily. They wanted to come and help. And that's how we became involved in, in that portion of it is who are you, what can you do? And right. as you know, you know, donations being a big thing, uh, everybody wants to give. 
everybody wants mm-hmm. to take care. So, but they want to give to an organization that that is going to make sure the money gets where it needs, and that's been a problem. It has been. It has been, and and changing that stigma of, you know, it's going to be used for the wrong thing has to change. Right. We we right. have to change that as organizations, as volunteer organizations. Um, having our social media presence and having that trusted source of information has mm-hmm. become so helpful in that. We know where to send the money, where to make sure people get things. And, and not to really even taking in money, if they're bringing in cases of water during hurricane, or I'm sorry, during um, wildfires, reallocating mm-hmm. where that water needs to go so that one person or one organization isn't overwhelmed, the agency isn't overwhelmed. And everybody gets what they need. Yeah, no, that's good. The uh, donations are are key for helping with disasters, but it's also key for helping with your organization being able to do the things that you guys do, because you can't do it on your own dime. Um, believe me, I know I've been doing that uh, with uh, with my organization here in in Virginia, Civil Defense Virginia. Been mostly self funded. There's been a few small donations, but not a lot. But um, it, it's it's tough sometimes to get the process going, get the um, the word of mouth out there so people know who you are and what you're doing, and that it's a uh, it's reputable cause and and uh, organization. So you've done that mainly through your social media presence. Is that is that what I understand? We have, and and through our grants and donations writing, uh, we do have we have gone and asked for grants. Uh, mm-hmm. The the two biggest grants that we have received have been actually uh, from two different Fort Hood organizations, the Fort Hood Spouses Club and the Fort Hood Thrift Shop. Both were ex- uh, were excited to donate to our organization and provide our our original budgeting to allow us to develop even beyond what we have to get bags for training and the uh, the costs associated with becoming a, an organization in the state of Texas. Now, when you guys train new volunteers, do you give them a, a cert bag as well, as just like some of these other uh, municipalities would do? No, we don't actually provide them with one that they can keep. Because we do have limited uh, limited funding, we have bags that we use for our training purposes that we retain. Uh, but it allows them to use that, and then they can go out and purchase either a cert bag, if they so choose, or develop their own bag uh, with what they would use. That makes a lot of sense. I've seen uh, a couple of them... I, um, advertise online and, and, uh, there's, you know, certain, certain things that, that to me looked, um, a little, little cumbersome, like some of the gloves. Personally, when I'm doing things, I like a different style of glove than what has normally been in a, a cert bag. Oh, definitely. I, my hands are so much smaller and I can't use the, 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 the work gloves that are in these bags. They just don't fit. So I, in my personal bag, I have gloves that fit me, well, like a glove. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> How's that work? <laughs> <laughs> but it allows me the manual dexterity to do things while still protecting my hands from heat and cold and, and electrical as well because of the way they're insulated. Yes. Now, do you guys recommend the online courses as well as your your actual in-house courses? To, uh, to certify people in, in CERT, or how, how do you work with that? Okay, so basically, if, we're, if you're coming to our course, the, the CERT course, the CERT basic course, there is no other requirement for you to take any of the online courses. We just want you to have that community preparedness portion. As members of our team, though, we do require the NIMS courses. We require um, the 100, 200, 700, 800 courses, which are all online. They're computer-based training, do it at your own speed, and then then they provide us their certificates afterwards, along with taking DG317 course in person. 
that we teach twice a year. Okay. Well, that's good. So where do you see uh, Centex Dart going in the next um, next three to five years? We hope just to maintain what we have and build our relationships within our community, uh, build additional relationships in our region, and then work alongside other organizations to help them develop as well. I know our instructors want to continue to learn uh, and take more courses so that they can then teach more courses to the community. And our government officials, emergency managers, uh, we hope to, to broaden our horizons as well as maintaining what we have uh, locally. Well, that's good. That's good. Now, as far as recommendations to our audience on CERT and getting involved, what, what would you recommend to them? If you have a CERT locally, go take the class, uh, volunteer. Because what you're going to get out of that is going to change that mindset of, I don't know how to help, to I know what I can do and I know how to get others involved. If there's no team in that area, go to your emergency manager and say, how do I do this? How do I start this? If they don't know, then reach out to us. We'll be happy to help that emergency management agency to develop what they need. Now, I've done that in my county, and my emergency manager says, I don't like CERT. I, I want another program. And I said, well, what, what program are you looking at? Oh, I'm, I haven't found one I like yet. Well, <laughs> unfortunately, that doesn't work. I like CERT. CERT is a, is a great program. But in many ways, it it's not something – that somebody would want to get involved with who is maybe homebound or, or something like that. So there's, there's limitations on, on CERT. And what I found was in the state of Washington, their emergency management, they have this program called Map Your Neighborhood. Are you familiar with that? I have heard of it, yes. Well, in, in the military, they, they teach us, you know, in, in training, you, you crawl, walk, and run. And the crawl stage, I think, for emergency response for civilian population is the map your neighborhood. The walk-run phase would probably be more cert, but um, the uh, basic intro is map your neighborhood. You might think about adding that into your program, being able to expand at least some preparedness, because what it does is it gets neighbors talking to each other about in case there's a, a windstorm or earthquake or something like that, because it was developed around an earthquake scenario. And I've talked with the, the woman who designed the program. She's a PhD, and, and she uh, she's working on some alterations to the program right now. Otherwise, I would have had her on the show already. But uh, it, it's, a, it's a neat program. And um, I, I've been promoting it all over the place. Almost every every show, I, <laughs> I mention something about it. But uh, uh, I want to offer it to you, and and I can send you the information. But um, you know, if you're if anybody who's interested, they can just go to YouTube and put map your neighborhood, and you can see the host of videos that are available on YouTube about that. It's it's something that that is easy, and for you know, I'm I'm thinking about. Areas where there's a lot of uh, retired people, senior people that may not be physically capable of doing some of the things that they would need to do in CERT, but they can help their neighbors be uh, be more aware and also help them out in case of, of uh, some type of emergency. Oh, most definitely. I really like the idea of Mass Your Neighborhood. I know that we have uh, folks who... Uh, very similar, aren't able to get out and do uh, based on, you know, their limitations. And, and they help us in maintaining our situational awareness through social media, through uh, what is, is essentially called a watchtower program. Uh, they can, oh, I'm sorry, what? A watchtower program. Oh, okay. Um, I know our team uses this as well as it. 
think of it more as a virtual operation, a virtual mm. EOC, where mm -hmm. they can keep an eye on the rivers and the streams and the traffic patterns, that type of thing. So I really like this idea of map your neighborhood because it keeps mm -hmm. it very local, combining that in then with our watchtower, um, our watchtower, our virtual operations folks. So I'm going to look more into that one. Yeah, yeah, I really recommend it. We have Culpeper County Civil Defense Association. They're they're becoming cert certified, but they're also using Map Your Neighborhood as an outreach to the community to get the, the conversation started about Map Your Neighborhood. In my guide that I wrote, which is the website, civildefenseradio.com, under the resources tab, it's at the top of the page, it mentions Map Your Neighborhood in there because I, I felt that it, it is such a, a basic level program that helps people at least get started, at least start talking to your neighbors about having some kind of plan in place in case something happens. I moved to Virginia in 2011, and just so happens that was the year that we had a, an earthquake here. And I was, <laughs> I just happened to be in the basement of our our building in Washington D.C. when the when the ground started trembling, you know that was a, not a <laughs> wow. good place to be. But I didn't know that it was coming, you know. So that's the whole thing. You don't know things are coming, and so especially an earthquake, it'll happen without you even knowing that it's coming. And so people have to be more prepared and more uh, responsible for being. Um, being engaged for such emergencies as this. And uh, that's why I feel that, you know, I needed to get you on our program to talk about your your great organization, but also uh, I, I promote Map Your Neighborhood because the best way for people to get started talking in their neighborhoods, because I, be, I believe that there's a building process. It starts with the individual, then it goes to the family, then it goes to the neighborhood, then it goes to the community, and then it can go beyond. But those those are the core right there, family, neighborhood, community. And when when the, the family's stronger, the neighborhood's stronger. When the neighborhood is stronger, the community is stronger and more resilient. So that's that's the process of building. And, and um, so Culpepper is using the map your neighborhood as an outreach. And I got this um, other municipality that's that's starting to build their uh, nucleus of, of a civil defense organization, and they're using the map your neighborhood also as a way to get things started. Oh, wow. Well, I'm definitely going to check into it and see how we can, uh, how we can adapt it or, or adopt it into our program. Yes, I, I recommend it. Now, as far as your your coordination and and everything with your your various communities and and um, emergency managers. Have you ran into any type of difficulties that uh, kept you from from working with an, a local municipality? Uh, not so much difficulties as far as um, working with them. Most of them now know our capabilities. Uh, previously, though, before they started realizing who we were and what we could do, we did have that. The only issues that we really run up against are their legal requirements for mutual aid agreements, having to run through um, either city government or uh, legal departments, that type of thing. But otherwise, no, we really have a great relationship with our with our local uh, emergency management agencies, both at uh, the city level and county level. Okay. That's that's good because that word of mouth, so to speak, uh, reputation is, uh, is very beneficial. Oh, definitely. Uh, we have, um, with, our, with our social media presence, we actually have ties into different uh, emergency management coordinators, we have ties into our regional advisory committees, our RAC, uh, our councils of government. And then we also have ties into the Texas Division of Emergency Management through through our membership as well. Mm, that's good. I, I, I don't remember if we talked about this. When did you guys get started? What, what year? 2000, oh, goodness, 2016. 
We actually, uh, we, we began in 2016. We became an official organization um, with the state of Texas and the IRS in January of 2018. Okay. So as an organization, you're relatively young. We are. We are. And, mm-hmm. and growing steadily. Not rapidly, but steadily. Yeah. No, that's, that's important. You know, with that steady growth is, is more uh, manageable, you might say. Most definitely. Now, there's a number of organizations out there, uh, some faith-based and some corporations. We have um, Christ in Action or the Baptist Ministries that go out and, and help out during disasters and, and um, other organizations like that. Have, have you partnered with any of them, or, or how, do, how does uh, that interaction go when you guys do end up in the, in the same area? We have actually worked alongside Texas Baptist Men, um, along with Salvation Army, uh, which is one of our best mutual aid partners here locally, and with our Catholic charity folks, our Methodist, what is it, the United Methodist Committee on Relief, I believe. But the, these folks are part of our Greater um, Central Texas VOAD, or Volunteer Organization Active and Disaster Group, and then the Texas mm-hmm. VOAD itself. So we work really well. We we all understand our own importance and our own roles and, and can assist one another seamlessly. Well, that's good. That's good. And Team Rubicon, too, right? We do have Team Rubicon. They are not as big in our area as they are in the major metro areas here in Texas. Hmm, that's interesting. Recently, I, I got to be friends with a, uh, a gentleman out of Houston who developed an organization after Harvey. Theirs is um, uh, Texas Disasters, Inc. Have you heard of them or, or John Cole, the uh, director? Uh, great guy, and, and the mission that, that they're doing is is spectacular. They formed as a regular corporation, but they're they're taking a different tack on things. They're looking at, at developing a social media presence that uh, will be a regular regular presence and be able to offer aid to people. Because one of the things that they did during Harvey was they were using Zello to reach out to people who needed rescuing. And so they would dispatch people with boats to, to the area and help them out and stuff. But they found that there was a lot of problems with that. So you guys you guys don't necessarily get involved in that, that realm, correct? Uh, no, not necessarily. I know we do use, uh, we actually use that same communication, um, the Zello application for mm-hmm. our team for internal communication. But we aren't falling in the, the same realm as they are. Uh, with them being in Houston and being in the area that would get hit, we deal more up here with the evacuees from that area. So we have a little bit of time, um, advanced planning that we can work with unless we get hit with our own flash floods or tornadoes or wildfire. Um, right. We, we do have the, the blessing that we have some advanced planning available. Mm. Yeah, that helps. I was living in San Antonio when Katrina happened, and uh, we had a mall down the road that was pretty much empty and they they use that as an emergency shelter for a lot of the people that came in from from the uh the affected area of new orleans oh definitely any large um building of that nature that can be appropriately secured and have the power and water and space available most definitely Mm -hmm. well this is this has been great andrea do you have any last words for our audience, well, some of the things that you want to you want to relay to them that uh, we haven't had a chance to to talk about. Uh, primarily, what I would say is get out there and get involved. If you can't find it, create it. If you can find it, make it better. There's always room for improvement in any organization that you get into. What you bring to the table is more than what they had previously. So get out there and share your skills. <laughs> That's awesome. I, I agree with that 100%. Well, thank you, Andrea. 
And, um, you know, the, the top-down governmental approach to solve our community resiliency problem has failed us. We need a community-based grassroots approach like Centex DART to solve the problems of resiliency. We are looking for volunteers throughout the nation to pick up the mantle of civil defense for their communities. Let's start a conversation with the guide found on our resources page at civildefenseradio.com. Be sure to check out our regular postings on our Facebook page at Civil Defense Radio and on Twitter at civil underscore def, D-E-F underscore radio, where we post information regularly about the many threats we see to our nation and the security and safety of our people. I wish to thank you again, Andrea, for being on the show, and I want to thank our listeners. I really appreciate you guys listening to our show this week. So please, be safe, be informed, be prepared, and may God bless you until next time.